Now, more than ever, we need to focus on stories of strength, courage, and unity. Welcome to COVID Talks, a series dedicated to promoting positive conversations during uncertain times. Good evening and welcome to our fifth episode of COVID Talks, positive conversations during uncertain times. My name is Anthony Rapp. I'll be your host for the night. Uh, so tonight we have we have a great show. Uh, we have a special guest tonight, Mr. Cliff Hagen, who's going to be speaking with us about uh, great historical facts about Staten Island. He and I were just chatting behind the scenes. Uh, man is like an onion. He's got many layers. Uh, he's going to tell us about some Staten Island history, about things that um, we can do on Staten Island right now, even though we're under quarantine, some great places that you can go to take a hike, take a walk, of course, practicing social distancing. Um, so we're going to get into that. Later on in the broadcast, we're also going to let you know who today's COVID hero of the day is. Uh, we'll make that announcement later. But right now, we're going to get into our daily headlines. Uh, and our first headline of today, the first good news of the day, is coming from uh, our friends over at Crocs. So love them, hate them. I personally don't think that Crocs are a fashion-forward brand. However, we got to respect them. Crocs right now has launched a program to give a free pair of shoes to every healthcare worker working on the front lines. So Crocs, we appreciate what you're doing. Uh, some great positive news right now. Uh, and thank you for doing that. There's more information at their website as to how you can ascertain your free pair of shoes if you are a first responder. Uh, and then next up, uh, some more good news uh, of people exiting hospitals, of people recovering from the coronavirus. Uh, so we had something posted on Twitter. This was yesterday. Um, young lady Molly McManamy. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, but she filmed a beautiful video of her father-in-law who was hospitalized for three weeks uh, coming out of Staten Island University Hospital. We had a quick clip of that to share with you. All right, so we're thankful that um, we're thankful that they're home and that they're recovered. And then finally, the the last headline is somewhat funny because the only thing worse than being stuck inside the house right now is the fact that we're all eating, right? So uh, the last headline of today that we found of interest is the fact that right now a donut shop in Rochester, New York, has created and is selling the Dr. Anthony Fossey donut. Uh, so. Right now, you could actually go to their website. You could purchase one of these donuts, and they will ship them to you. Um, what started out as what the owner of the establishment said uh, a joke and as a way to sort of highlight the good work that uh, Dr. Fossey is doing, um, he's sold thousands of donuts, literally. So good move from a marketing standpoint, great move from a business standpoint. And you can check them out online. You could pick up, you know, have Dr. Fossey's face um, on your donut. And the last headline is going to be the Corona check, right? The recovery check. So let's take a look. Um, so right now, yes, the numbers are still increasing, but what you really aren't reading about right now or seeing in the news or on social media is the recovery and discharge rate. So right now, close to 300,000 people have been uh, released from hospitals and or completely recovered. So once again, that's just you know, stuff that's not being heavily reported, but stuff that we're, we're interested in and we're interested in sharing with you guys. Uh, so before we bring on our guest, just want to give you a heads up as to where you can follow us and how you can continue to watch our programming. You can follow us at COVID Talk on Facebook. Check out videos uh, on covid-talks.com. You can also watch and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And after every episode, uh, we also create a podcast. And the podcast is available on iTunes and on Spotify as well. And before we introduce our next guest, if you're interested in being a guest or interested in a specific topic, shoot us an email, info at prcision.com, and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to get you guys on and discuss topics of interest to the people who watch and subscribe. All right. So with that, I am going to attempt to 
highlight all of the accolades for our next guest. So we're going to bring on Mr. Cliff Hagen, who, as I said, I had a pleasure of speaking with in the green room before we began the program. Uh, and the man is truly like an onion. Many, many layers, tons of history, tons of great stuff that he's going to bring to the show tonight. He is actually a descendant of the original Dutch settlers on Staten Island. For those of you who didn't know that, yes, Staten Island was settled by the Dutch originally. So he is an ancestor of the first Dutch settlers here on Staten Island. In fact, his great, great, great grandfather was the third borough president uh, of Staten Island. He is also a special education teacher at IS-72 Rocco Laurie School right here on Staten Island. And finally, uh, he is the president of Protectors of Pine Oak Woods. And he and I just had a conversation as to what that is, and I'm excited for him to share it with you because you're going to be amazed at the work that this organization has done. And none of us really understand what it is. So I'm, I'm glad he's going to be able to get his message out and tell us about all the great work that they're doing over there. So Cliff, yes, we're live. Are you there, brother? I'm here. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. Thank you very much. Well, like um, I said, man, with many layers. <laughs> yes. It'll be hard to focus on one, one or two uh, topics. Yeah. So but I appreciate the introduction. Thank you. Absolutely. And we appreciate you being here with us. Uh, I know you got a lot of stuff that you could share with us, like we were sharing before in the green room, but let's open up with a very easy and generic question. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background, your history, um, growing up on Staten Island. Tell us about the interesting stuff you were sharing with me about the Dutch settlers, and then we'll segue into the uh, all the great work you're doing with the parks and recreation areas. But tell us about you. Sure. I'd be happy to. So my maternal family, my maternal grandmother was from Mariners Harbor. She was a Van Name, and the Van Name family goes back to the 1600s. They're one of the original families that that settled Staten Island, one of the Dutch families. So I grew up in Westerly, and there was a brook that ran down through Westerly right along Woolley Avenue. And my friends and I would just spend the day in that brook, climbing trees, making dams, building forts, just having a great time outdoors. Eventually, that brook because of development, uh, a lot of new friends from Brooklyn moved into the neighborhood. The trees were cut down. The brook was put under Woolley Avenue in storm sewers and Westerly changed. Still a great place to live, but Westerly changed. I eventually grew up. I became an adult, moved out of Westerly. I now live down in Eltingville with my wife and three daughters. Still wish I could climb trees. Still wish I could build dams and brooks. <laughs> but uh, those days are beyond me. But now you're protecting it for guys like me so that we're able to get out there and our kids can get out there and do it. That's right. So, and that's so, what Protector of Pine Oak Woods has been doing since 1975. Uh, that's our mission. It's a twofold mission, actually. Good. We, we uh, advocate an increase in stewardship of parks properties, but we also advocate the uh, preservation of open space on Staten Island. And we've been pretty successful these past 45 years. And now you're being modest. So you shared with me something before that that astounded me. Your organization is uh, has a membership of almost or over a thousand people. So you have a thousand members that are part of the organization. And share yep. with us, share with us all of the the names and locations and parks that everyone on Staten Island knows, but didn't know that you guys were behind. Share that. That's very important to me. Sure. So in 1975, when the organization began, it was just three men. And they worked to preserve Clay Pit Park. Everyone now knows, I believe, familiar with Clay Pit Pond State Park Preserve. It's not just a park. It's got a special recognition as a preserve. It's supposed to be used for environmental education, stu education study. And so after Clay Pit Park, the organization then moved on to uh, Blue Heron Park. 1984, Blue Heron Park became a park, a city park. From there, uh, they've had plenty of success. Kingfisher Park in Great Kills. They worked with uh, local folks for Wood Duck Pond Park in Great Kills. Uh, more recently, Pouch Camp. We were very involved with Pouch Camp, the Goodyear Woods. Uh, if you consider a park on Staten Island, protectors probably played a role in the preserv preservation of that park. So pretty much everything that everyone on Staten Island knows, enjoys, and frequents, your organization has had a direct impact on allowing us to use it. Is that a fair statement? It's a very fair statement. So imagine this, it's 500,000 people on Staten Island. Right. And just 1,000 people are members. It's one out of 500. That's a shame because 
most of us enjoy the benefits of those bars. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about um, sort of hidden gems, right? So even though we're in quarantine, we're still able to, thank God right now, at least walk outside, take a stroll, take a run, ride a bike. And there's probably no one better equipped to share with us some hidden gems here on the island than you. So everyone knows Mount Loretto. Everyone knows, as you mentioned, um, Blue Heron Park. But what's what's sort of the place that that you know and that your organization loves and that may be a hidden place for people to safely go take a walk, a run, ride a bike, bring their kids? One, one of the newest city parks. Uh, it's a nice flat area, wide open expanse. Uh, Brookfield Park on Arthur Kill, right down near Armstrong Avenue. The beautiful park, big open areas, plenty of space to avoid others, <laughs> as long as they don't get too crowded. It's similar to Mount Loretta. Mount Loretta is a large open area. Brookfield might be a little larger, and it's a little flatter. So it's a terrific spot to go hide. Brookfield is larger than Mount Loretta, really? It might be. The walking trails. There might be more trail than Mount Loretta. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's, that's one of the places I would suggest people to go check out, if it's not too crowded already. Of course, any beach, any beach is a terrific place to go. Yeah, especially um, a day like today. Yes, it's beautiful out, and I understand Silver Lake is very crowded, but maybe Clove Lakes Park is not so. Not too. If you if you think up on the North Shore, Silver Lake, I'm getting reports that Silver Lake Park is very crowded during the day. Not so much in the evening as the sun goes down, but during the day, there's a lot of families in the apartments around Silver Lake. A lot of folks enjoying the property there. But Clove Lakes, maybe not as crowded. So you might want to consider Clove Lakes rather than Silver Lake. And if you get adventurous, you could go on just not too far away, less than a mile from Silver Lake, is the Goodyear Woods, Allison Pond Park in the Goodyear Woods. That's also a new city park that protectors played a role in uh, preserving. Very cool. So I want to just highlight because you you said about three places that, you know, I'm born and raised on Staten Island and only one of the three or four you mentioned have I ever heard of. So we want to direct people to check you guys out at siprotectors.org. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to tell people about, you know, follow your Facebook page. I myself just did it prior to the broadcast yeah. uh, because you're going to be sharing some news and events and tips. So tell me a little bit about uh, the contest you were, you were sharing with me earlier, this photo contest. Sure. So... 48 years ago, uh, then President Nixon had the forethought to create the EPA, which then one of the first things the EPA did was ban uh, the pesticide DDT. DDT, I can't pronounce the chemical name. DDT is the chemical that was being used and released in the environment. That then got into the water, got into the fish that lived in the water, and bald eagles and osprey two birds of prey that eat fish, the majority of what they eat is fish, they would eat fish, and the DDT, which is stored in the fish, would then get stored in the bird, in the eagle and the osprey. When they then laid eggs, those eggs were malformed. They weren't strong enough. So when the adult sat on the egg, which is their natural inclination, right. they would then squish the egg. They'd crack the egg, and the egg would not bear live birds. <laughs> So quickly, within just a number of years, the population of eagles and osprey plummeted. Uh, thankfully, when the, D, when the EPA stopped the use of DDT, within a number of decades, those birds, their populations rebounded. And just a year or two ago, the bald eagle was taken off the endangered species list. It has been doing so well. So See, now I thought it was because of the great work and the great flags of Scott Labedo that the American Eagle was coming back, but I'm wrong. I, I, okay. right. I got to make sure I text him later and tell him it's not really his responsibility. It's not because of him. And, and you mentioned Labedo, his brother Steve, terrific environmentalist. Steve has shared pictures with me of bald eagles that seem to enjoy spending time up in his Chapin Woods. Okay. And make a little connection there. But because we have bald eagles now nesting on Staten Island, uh, Adam Mount Loretto, 1996, Protectors of Pine Oak Woods with Governor Pataki, uh, coordinated with the Catholic Church, the preservation of that open space that everybody enjoys now, Mount Loretto, unique area of Mount Loretto. The bald eagles nest in that area. I won't tell you specifically where, but they're nearby. And they use those ponds for food. They fish in those ponds. Right, so we have a beautiful example of 
environmental action right here on Staten Island. So we're going to highlight that. We're sponsoring a, a photo exhibit uh, because it's 48 years since the banning of DDT, and we now have bald eagles nesting in the lower 48, each of the lower 48 states. So we're going to bring those together to help the John Kill Cullen director at Conference House Park. He and Frank Gessner have a terrific exhibit space down there at Conference House. So yep. we're going to utilize that space, hopefully, in June, June 22nd, I believe it is. We're going to have an opening exhibiting bald eagle photos. Very cool. And now, how would one submit a photo for, for consideration? Sure. So John Kilcullen down at Conference House is accepting them, and you can send them to us, Protectors of Pine Oak Woods. Uh, and they can do that on the Facebook page? Sure, through the Facebook page, through the online, through the website, or to email ppow at siprotectors.org. Very cool. So now, kind of kind of branching off of this topic, but you did mention it with the chemicals and all that stuff. So. In addition to all the great work you're doing, your wife is also a first responder as a CBP officer. So first yeah. of all, um, I admittedly didn't know what that was. So I'm, I'm so, sure most other people are a lot more intelligent than I am. But tell 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 our viewers and, and our listeners later on what what that is and, and what your wife's been involved in and what she's currently doing to help combat this virus. Sure. So my wife is a Custom Border Patrol agent over at Newark Airport, and she is an agriculture specialist. She's a microbiologist by trade. So when you come off your flight from overseas, international flights, and they ask if you have something to declare, she's the one that is going to take your contraband. And it would be wise if you do have something to declare, let them know. They find you, uh, they can eventually imprison you if things were to get bad. <laughs> yeah. And so what's, what kind of, I mean, I'm sure she's coming home with, lots of lots of stories and lots of information but is she seeing anything positive is she seeing uh you know what what's what's a day-to-day -day for her i mean we've heard about you know uh emt workers we know fdny the nypd but this is a, a brand new segment of uh of of first responders at least to me that that sure. people aren't considering but yet here you we know. are and there she is doing her job day in and day out to protect us so does she have any stories or what's going on uh day to day Unfortunately, she and her colleagues, her coworkers, they were the first line defenders before anyone really knew any of this, the, the severity of it, right? So as everybody returned back to the States from overseas, you'd be amazed how many people were overseas. They all came through the airports, you know, our flight attendants, our CBP officers, all of those people were the first line uh, of defense, I guess, in a sense, right? Before we even knew what was truly happening. Now, most flights have been canceled. 80, 90% of flights have been canceled. So right. now there are not as many people coming through the airports. But back in January, February, there were hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. So now, I mean, but so is it is it completely empty? I mean, from what I understand, from my knowledge of watching, yeah. you're not allowed to do anything. So are there still, is there still activity? Is there still stuff there going on? Flights. Sure, there are still people that are going on honeymoons, unfortunately. There are people who are away for long occasions and they're just now coming back people away on business and jobs change people get laid yeah. off you know life life happens so there are still people needing to travel but nothing like it had been right yeah. so i want to go back because i still find this so interesting you got to tell yeah. me more about because i would bet my life on it mm -hmm. that whether people are watching now or they're watching it later or they're listening to the podcast i know yeah. for a fact because 99% of my friends wouldn't know. So I'm sure 99% of the population doesn't know. Okay. Talk about the fact that you're a direct descendant from the Dutch. So for anyone looking, watching, or listening, yes, the Dutch settled Staten Island. That's a fact. I'm sure you yeah. didn't know that. But, yeah. but talk a little bit about that. So your great, great, great grandfather was... So I, I do, um, as a school teacher, I do teach a little bit of Staten Island history to my sixth grade ELL, ELIT uh, students. And I think, I mean, the, the, my research is a little fuzzy, but I think it was 19, 1645, there was something called the Peach Wars, right? So a uh, young Native American girl in lower Manhattan um, stole, supposedly took a piece of fruit from somebody. That person then 
um, you know, was physical with that young girl. I'm not sure if he killed her or hurt her in some way. She went back to her family and those Native Americans took revenge and they burned down every structure on Staten Island. And it was the Peach Wars, if you went and looked for it. And they, they wow. vandalized Lower Manhattan. It was ugly. Uh, then soon after that, they brought back more Dutch in the 1660s, about 20, 30 years later. And that's when my family came, the Van Ames. So back at the turn of the century, the last century, 1900, there were two men, uh, William T. Davis, a naturalist, a well-known naturalist from Staten Island, and his good friend Charles Lang, a historian on Staten Island. The two of them got together and they created a, an eight-volume book, The History of Staten Island, because they really? wanted to share it. Yeah. <laughs> History, you have it, access to this? I'm sorry? You have access to this? I wish I had a copy. They are in a few libraries. They're still around. Wow. Because what they did, no one had money to produce an eight-volume. Right, to publish a book. Sure. So they went knocking on doors. And they said, listen, if you give us a few dollars, we will add your family history to this book. So if you go into... The history of Staten Island by Langan Davis. You can find my family's history there, the Van Ame family. That's 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 an amazing story. So, do yeah. you have old? I mean, this is an off off the record. I'd love to follow up with you, but do you have like old photos of these? No, people? no, I don't have any of that stuff. That'd be an amazing, an amazing thing to share. Sure, sure. My right, grandma so would tell stories growing up in Mariners Harbor. Her and her brothers and sisters, they'd go down to the waterfront and go swimming. They dive off the piers into the water of Mariners Harbor, the shipyards up there now. Right. Yeah. So, but there were no pictures. Folks didn't have it like we have it now. Anything. Just, I mean, I wish I could get my hands on on that that series of books you're talking about. Well, sure, I'll look around. Most libraries have a copy. I'm, I'm, I, I gotta, definitely got to find that out. Uh, yeah. the, the closest person I know who I consider a historian uh, is Councilman mm -hmm. Joe Borelli. Joe Borelli knows a ton of history. So I'm sure. going to... I'm going to give him a ring and see if he's ever heard of this. I'm, not only has he heard of it, he probably has an original signed copy knowing him. But I've never heard of this volume of books, and I'd love to get my hands on it just mm -hmm. for, for my own purposes to see um, to see what it is and read about it. Sure. So at this point, I'm going to um, – let's see if we can open it up. we got about a dozen or so people watching Cliff, which is great. Right. So right now, to kind of segue into our Q&A, which will begin after the next segment – um, we started something, uh, the second episode, uh, and the, the concept is simple, right? We're trying to spread positive news during uncertain times. So what better way to do that than to highlight a hero or an organization that's doing great work? So yesterday we had the Carl V. Beanie Memorial Fund. Uh, they were our COVID hero of the day. Yesterday they went out location to location uh, of firehouses, police precincts, uh, and hospitals yesterday on the Rescue 5 fire truck rig. They drove around and physically handed uh, over 100,000 pairs of gloves and upwards of 25,000 masks out to first responders who needed them. So that was yesterday. Not that it was yesterday's news. Uh, they're still doing great work, but that was yesterday's um, COVID hero of the day. And today we have um, another organization that's that's very near and dear to my heart. We have the Staten Island Rotary Club. Uh, so I believe the article appeared in today's Staten Island Advance. If it was not today, it was yesterday. But our local Staten Island Rotary Club, uh, they got together and they raised funds and a distribution chain, and they were able to purchase and distribute 5,000 hazardous material suits. So those hazmat suits that first responders and medical practitioners are wearing, uh, they were able to get out 5,000 of those. So... We are, we are thankful that the Rotary Club is, is in existence. I'm sure most of us are familiar with them. You can check them out at rotaryclubofsi.org. Uh, but thank you to the Rotary Club for being today's COVID hero of the day. Um, and then with that being said, if you or someone you know is interested in being a guest with us, like Cliff was tonight, uh, just let us know. You want to be a guest, have a topic, want us to discuss something in specific, shoot us an email at info at prcision.com and we'll get that up and we'll get that going. We want to give a quick program preview to tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we have Danny Casella, 
president of the Amalgamated Transit Union here on Staten Island. He's going to be live with us tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. Um, as you all know, public transit is still operational. Danny's going to give us an inside look and an inside view as to what's going on behind the scenes, how transportation is still working and functioning, uh, and more importantly, what these workers, these men and women who are transit workers are doing to stay safe and stay positive, uh, especially during these times. And then we have what we're considering right now, our most requested show uh, since we began. So we're having uh, a special edition on Friday night, April 10th at 7 p.m. And this is going to be surrounding Quarantine Kitchen, right? So if anyone out there is looking or, or watching, Quarantine Kitchen is a Facebook group. It's a Staten Island Facebook group started by the Kangiano family. Uh, and they began this Facebook group with an idea and a post. And the group grew from one member to 10,000 members in about six days. So there's a huge demand for eating. There's a huge demand for cooking. So we're going to actually have an intimate conversation with the Kangianos and talk to them about the group, about what they plan on doing and what the, what the future of the group is going to hold. So with that, Cliff, there you are. So let's see. Let's go in the comment section and see if there's anything else other than people making fun of me. Let's see. <laughs> so, I got, oh, so we got my friend Mike Bloomfield. Shout out to the father of uh, the godfather of streaming. Mike Bloomfield started this this whole fiasco with uh, streaming live. He does three or four shows a day. Um, there's Marco. Cliff, you said Marco would be on. There you go, Marco. We got Donnie, Cliff Hagen, and Vito. Vito, I want to give Vito a shout out. Vito's been watching since day one. Uh, Vito has been messaging me, and he he called me a few times. Every time he calls, it's right after the show. But Vito, I'm going to call you tonight. Uh, I know you got some great guests you want to get on. We want to have you on as well, Vito. So we're looking forward to that. My good friend Tom Bannis. Tom Bannis wants a bread recipe. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you one. We'll send you one, Tom Bannis. Uh, but Tom Bannis also has a great show. Uh, he's the owner of a company called Down to the Felt. Uh, they are a casino rental game room facilitating company. Great company. He has a talk, uh, I believe it's at 10 p.m. every night, and he talks with guests in the poker industry and in the uh, entertainment arena. Mm -hmm. So looking down, all right, so we got we got Frank Rappacciolo. Shout out to my nephew yeah. for helping me out as we die here, all right? So, uh, Cheech, what is the next owl talk? Yeah, so just to let you know, for about 15 years now, since my first child was born, I can't go out bird watching during the day as much, so I go out at night. And I started doing owl prowls and I take groups of people into the woods at night and I call owls and the owls come out, they respond. Sometimes they fly right in, we get to see them. So the owl prowls are a big hit. We get I'm 30. Gonna stop you that one second, not to be rude. Yeah. You said you call out owls. Is that what you said? I do. Yeah. I, I mimic. I just want to make sure I heard you right. Can yeah. you give us a demonstration of what an owl call sounds it's like? A whistle. It's just a whistle. Okay. But it's loud in the woods at night when it's quiet. And if the owls are close enough and they hear the whistle, they respond. They whistle back. And a lot of times they'll fly within 10 feet so you get to see them. So I do, I've been doing these owl prowls. Dozens of people come out, right? So, But I can't do them now. I'm not allowed to bring people into the woods right. with me. So I've been doing a couple of Facebook Live owl prowls. And I go out alone into the park at night. And uh, I've been doing owl prowls, and a lot of people, 30, 40, 50 people are with me on Facebook Live. It's a lot of fun, similar to this, the live stream. That's great. Can you, can you, give, us, can you give us that owl call one more time? <laughs> well, there are hoots. So I, I don't want to just harp on one because they hoot, they whistle, they bark, they whine. They do a lot of different, uh, a lot of calls. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like, it sounds like kids. And it, yeah. Whistling and you, Facebook page. You can see it there. Well, I protect his Facebook page. We posted Very the cool. yellow prowls there. All right. So let's see. There's nothing else. There's nothing else coming in through the through the comments. Um, so with well, that, I want to let me take yeah, a moment. If you don't mind, Anthony. What so do you got? Go ahead. I, I'll, I'll take what we said about the owls. Um, when I'm at on the owl prowls, I don't acknowledge what park I'm in. Out of respect for the owls, I don't want people flooding that park and and harassing the owls. They're on their nest right now. They're raising young right now. It's springtime. And the migration, the bird migration is in uh, full swing now. A lot of birds are migrating north for the winter, for the summer. They're going to start building nests. Um, a lot of people are in the parks. Mount Loretta, you can't find a parking spot. High Rock Park, there's loads of people walking around, which is terrific. It's nice to have people out in the parks. 
but I would ask people to be mindful, respectful when they're in the park, stay on the trail. Uh, Ed Burke would tell you, stay on the trail because of ticks. Steve Vandenberg would beat you up if she saw you off the trail. Ed Burke's of- a great guy. Shout out to Ed Burke. We love right? Ed Burke. So the ticks are a real, a real problem. Poison ivy is a real problem. You do not want to get poison ivy. You might prefer to have the tick than the poison ivy, right? And there are plenty of uh, insects and birds and snakes and salamanders that live just off the trail. That's their world. So we need to stay on the trail while we're walking through the park. These little balls of feather and bone, three, four ounce birds fly 100, 200 miles through the night. The sun comes up, they fall down into a tree and then we come, a bunch of clodhoppers come walking through the park, making a bunch of noise. It scares the bejesus out of these poor things. They're exhausted. They just flew 200 miles overnight. We need to be respectful of that. You know, We don't want to be too impactful walking through the woods. Very interesting. So Cliff, Tom Banis just uh, brought up something, and I think you touched on it, but let's just one more time. So what, what was the best place you mentioned on the island to go for some good sightseeing? Being mindful of social distancing, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, if you're bird watching, you certainly want to get to Clove Lakes Park. The valley, it's a Clove Valley. Uh, the birds funnel down through that valley, and you get some really good looks at the birds there. Another terrific spot, of course, Mount Loretto is beautiful any time of year. Uh, we mentioned Brookfield Park earlier. That's a, yeah. that's a new city park. Uh, so these birds, pretty much everywhere on Staten Island, if you go to a park and sit quiet for a few minutes, you'll hear the birds singing. The birds migrating, they start singing now. They're trying to attract mates as they migrate. So when they get to the mating grounds, they're all set and ready to go. Very interesting, very cool. Yeah, it's all right, so... Cliff, I want to thank you for being with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we just want to remind everyone once again where you can find us and how you can see us. You can go to COVID Talk at Facebook. COVID-Talks.com is the official website. Check out the YouTube channel. We're also on a podcast on iTunes and Spotify. And so, Cliff, before we close, we close out with our video. Any last words, words of wisdom, words of inspiration? So as you're sharing the heroes, you made me think of um, Sandy and what happened after Sandy, right? After Storm Sandy. I, I had the the ability to go down and help out at Tauntonville High School, got involved down there. I met my buddy Guido Caligara, a little shout out Guido down in Tauntonville. So we were getting so many supplies down there. Tauntonville was overwhelmed with uh, yeah. the community sharing what they could. Um, I call my friend Monsignor Jeff Conway, uh, Star. All Lady Star to see. He suggested I speak to the head of Mount Loretto. Yeah, he's a great guy. He suggested I speak to the man at Mount Loretto. I turned around and Alex Ablocki came walking in the door with the man from Mount Loretto. So I I approached him. I forget his name. Sorry for that. But he said, of course, you could use the gym in the back. And so I turned to Guido and said, what do we do? We got a space. How do we move all of this stuff over there? We walked outside and Jack Ryan from Project Hospitality pulled up with a huge moving truck and it all just fell together and we were able to get out to Mount Loretto and start organizing an amazing community effort out there. It really was terrific being able to share all of those with the people in need. That's a, that's a great story. So maybe, is, maybe we'll have them, uh, we'll nominate them for tomorrow's COVID talk. Here. <laughs> well, that was, that was Sandy. That was a while back, but it's unfortunate. We have this uh, dilemma and it's hard to get involved. It's hard to uh, help people with this. So what you're doing here, I appreciate what you're doing. It's an opportunity for people to at least get involved a little bit, hear what's going on and, and lend a hand a bit. Well, I appreciate you giving a shout out. Believe, to the believe me when I tell you, we appreciate you being with us. And uh, I look forward to becoming good friends with you when you life returns to normal, because I want to sit down and have a cup of espresso with you and talk about all the interesting stuff about the, the settlers, the history, and all the other stuff, and then bring my wife and my young son, my three-month-old son. We'll mm-hmm. go hoot and hollering in the park. Just tell us where and when. When all is said and done, we'd love, to, we'd love to come out there and hang out with you. Sounds like a good time, man. Thank all right. you. So, thank you, you again, Cliff. We'll see everybody tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m., and we have our guest, Danny Casella. Once again, this is COVID Talks, positive conversations during uncertain times. We'll see you tomorrow.